Hi, everyone. You've got um, me with Ben Fetter, who uh, we've both agreed have got this very, very weird way in which our lives have kind of crossed paths, uh, including having both been students at Brasenose College at Oxford at the same time, having both been at Harvard Business School, having both kind of crossed paths in New York. And then most recently, I discovered that Ben has family in Israel. And so uh, we connected physically in person because Ben came to my ValueX uh, meeting in clusters where he was a star performer because he knows so much about things I know nothing about. And it's kind of exciting for me to have you here, Ben. And so I'm just going to pause and see if you want to correct anything I've said so far and allow you to say hello to the audience. Hello, Ben. Hi, hi guys. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's really, a it's a, it's really great. You make it sound like I have a second family in Israel, but that's not the case. I have one family, <laughs> and I have, I have extended family in Israel. And and another weird parallel, but this is probably just making connections where none are deserved. Um, I woke up at six a.m. this morning in Zurich to go cycling with a friend, and it turns out that it's six a.m. for Ben in Los Angeles. So that's where Ben is. And I just want to warn the audience: Ben's told me that. He might get room service coming in during the podcast, and I've told him that we are going to just continue to roll because that's the way it happens. And so I want to dive straight into my fascination with or my interest in understanding Ben's path in life that has been uh, so close to mine, but also very, very different. And what I get to do in these conversations, Ben, is ask you questions, which would be kind of like intrusive in a bar conversation, but I can do it here. So can you can you you know when I was uh, last year at business school I was actually invited out to an interview at Warner Brothers I had no clue about the movie industry I was not going to go work for Warner Brothers but perhaps you can explain to me I'm sure that you would have been interested in the same kinds of jobs that many people that I was at business school with wanted were interested in which would have been investment banking or consulting uh, or investing how comes you didn't take that route and how did you end up in the media industry. Um, it's a great question. Um, I think they're, they're like anything that happened in the past, they're kind of, you know, you revisit it a few times and there are multiple answers to the same question. Um, part of the answer is that I was interested in being an entrepreneur and that's always what I've been interested in doing. Um, I would say that, you know, as I gone through my career, I, 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 I'll admit to having a little bit of a chip on my shoulder and having not spent like two years at Goldman Sachs or McKinsey because I sort of feel like, you know, those are the stripes you need to earn to, you know, be in this business or be in business period. Um, and, you know, despite like you and I meeting at a prestigious university, I have this kind of like, I don't know, I have this ADD. I, I mean, I, I, I like I have ADD and, um, you know, I don't know that I have the discipline to kind of do the mainstream thing. I always seem to have to have a strategy for going around the sides. I think ADD people kind of tend to be great entrepreneurs because they always have to have a strategy for figuring out how to work their way around the world as opposed to just doing it the normal way. Um, so I don't know, I just kind of wanted to be an entrepreneur. And when I left business school, I got two pieces of advice that I thought were really interesting and that I still pass on to young professionals that seek advice for me today. And one, the first one is that, you know, the early years in your career are very important because they form good habits. They form their habits. And the best thing you can do is form good habits because the only thing you can do if you form bad habits is, you know, is, you know, you can't go up from there. You can go down from good habits, but it's very hard to kind of really improve your habits over time. And the best thing you can do is go to a place that has high standards and holds you to high standards. And, you know, by that measure, by the way, McKinsey and Goldman Sachs, you know, would tick that box many times over. Um, the second piece of advice, so that's kind of thing one. And then thing two was, hey, if you want to be an entrepreneur, don't do it out of business school. This is before the days of the internet, before, you know, Peter Thiel was paying people to drop out of college. And, um, you know, don't do it, don't do it immediately. Go make your mistakes off of somebody else's dime. And um, uh, and then you can be an entrepreneur later. And I thought that was good advice too. So I really sought out uh, my first job. I sought out something that ticked both of those boxes. And I got an opportunity to work for Rupert Murdoch at News Corporation. And so it was an opportunity to learn from, you know, an amazing entrepreneur, say what you will about succession. And um, I thought it was an opportunity to learn from uh, from a great organization and a great team. And one thing about 
the executive team and for MBAs coming out of, coming into News Corp, at least at that time in the world. This is that time was um, this is like right after many people don't remember News Corp almost went out of business. They had, they piled on a ton of debt and um, they came. They were they were they had a really quite severe near death experience. And I joined right after that. And the consequence of that is that the organization was super lean. Um, they were kind of, you know, there was one step between, you know, me and uh, senior management. I was invited to all the meetings and I got to learn a shit ton. So, um, so that was great. And it was one of these jobs that, you know, spent two years in corporate and then we'll move you down to one of the operations and kind of go learn how to learn how to, how to run a business. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did that and I thought it was a great opportunity. And that just, it was almost by happenstance. I did not have, I didn't, I didn't wake up at 10 years old and say, I need to be a media executive. Yeah. And I, and in, in, in one of these strange parallels is that I think, Ben, and uh, forgive me, the audience, if this is not interesting to you, it's interesting to me, is that when I went out for that interview at Warner Brothers, I think either I ran into you or I reached out to you, one of the two, and we ended up saying hello to each other on one of these mm -hmm. movie studio lots, or one mm -hmm. of these restaurants connected to a yep. movie studio. I'm um, sorry. Uh, I should tell the audience, and I probably should have brought it into the introduction, that uh, uh, in a sort of different way to me, Ben had a moment where he said he wanted to get out of the New York uh, rat race, so to speak. He ended up in Bali for a period of time, and he ended up writing a book about it. And in a certain way, the book is not dissimilar to my book, and it's, it's a kind of a coming of age sort of um, uh, a narrative of, of, of becoming uh, older and wiser and more reflective on one's life, which is just kind of fascinating. But um, yeah, so you ended up, I, I'm not sure which uh, of the um, uh, operating businesses of Fox you ended up uh, working at. And I, 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 you know, I've reviewed Ben's um, uh, online profiles, but I'm not sure if you go into it in much depth. And I'm just kind of curious, I guess, which one. Well, it feels like ancient history at this point. It was actually, it ended up as a failed business, which I suppose is also a good learning experience. Um, uh, it was a company called Delphi Internet. So this was what we would now call an, an ISP or an online service provider. Um, and so think back in history at the time, the big uh, internet companies were AOL, Prodigy, and uh, I'm probably missing one. I know there's one CompuServe and, uh, and Delphi was this backwaters um, company that Rupert bought. He's like, I don't know what they do, but they sell subscriptions and I sell subscriptions. So I'm sure it'll all be fine. And um, so was that, and I kind of that was really my entree into the internet world and the intersection of of media and technology. Uh, so Delphi Internet, uh, you know, they sold, they competed with AOL at the time. I think had two hundred thousand subscribers. So this was kind of early, early days. Yeah, and yeah. I, I'm you know, and I have down here. I'm going to go to it. Um, you know, I'm sure you were a strong student. Did you ever consider staying in the university world? I did. I did. You know, part of my ADD thing is comes with a little dyslexia. And I'm, I'm a painfully slow reader. And I kind of, you know, I know your world is so filled with books and, uh, and reading. And Anti-library. I, I don't actually read the books, Ben. I just have them here on display. <laughs> They're good props. No, I mean, I'm kind of a big reader also. I just, you know, I wish I, I wish I was faster. Um, so uh, I did consider it. My first job actually was, at, you know, out of college was at the World Bank. Um, doing third world de development in Kenya and Malawi, and um, you know mostly policy. And I mean, it wasn't on the ground; I was in Washington. And uh, and I got pulled aside and said, "Look, if you want a career at the World Bank, you need to get a PhD in economics." Right. Uh, and I thought about that for a while, and then I, you know, I turned it down. I was like, you know, I just, I'm just too, I have too much energy. I just, you know, I don't know. I can't sit for that long. Yeah. So uh, you know, that, that, which is what re required to get a PhD. Uh, and I just had to go to business school instead. And you know that I was accepted to do a PhD, but decided to do an MBA, and I agonized over that choice to do a PhD. What was, what was, what was your What was your subject? Um, uh, well, I, I was I did PP at Oxford, and for everybody's interest, I think Ben, you were a history student at Oxford, yeah. Yeah. and I went into consulting. And after two years, I wanted to go back and get a PhD, but first time around, I didn't get uh, an offer of a place where I wanted to do a PhD. And so the next time I reapplied, 
I uh, also applied for the MBA. So I applied to do a PhD and an MBA at Harvard, was accepted to both, could have done either a straight PhD, or I could have done the biz ec program, or I could have done the MBA. And I opted for the MBA and I have, I don't have regrets, but I have thoughts about what path my life would have taken. I might've been a guy at the World Bank, who knows. What was your subject? Oh, it, it, in terms of PhD, I had no idea what I would have done. I would have done some kind of, so I, I was a big, I was a big, um, fan of Michael Porter. I mean, the five forces model had just oh, like, out. Oh, a business, a business, a business doctorate. Yeah. Well, it, it, you know, and, and, and anyway, we can get into the, um, the fine tuning of, so, so what, uh, for those of you who are interested, what Ben just did is he did it just a very minor disc because in the world of academics, an economics <laughs> doctorate is not, is, is way more prestigious than uh, something in business and the business the harvard business school phd is not considered as academically fine as the graduate schools of arts and sciences but this one ben i will tell you was would have been awarded from the graduate school of arts and sciences the gsas which was a joint whatever we can <laughs> we can get into the niceties but and another parallel by the way that i uh, forgive me audience because this is not in the order because you got two adhd people talking to each other is that I also felt like I wanted to go and be an entrepreneur and work for somebody who could teach me. And as everybody knows who's read my book, I made the terrible choice of not working for the right person, if you like. Uh, you know, as you know, those of you who read my book, I went to the wrong place. And Where I don't think I, I went to a place called D.H. Blair. D. Blair, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, not the right place to be. And I probably, I did learn some very bad habits, but I got out of them fast. I mean, what, one thing that I would add, Ben, is if you're going to make mistakes, make them as early as possible in your career, yeah. you can recover from them. And something yeah. that comes up for me before I move on to my next set of questions about the media industry is I kind of get the, you know, I'm curious because your experience sounds a little bit like what somebody would have around Barry Diller and Interactive Corp. And I'm sure your life is intersected with all sorts of people in that, in that world. And I guess what I'm asking you for is a sense of how, in your experience, and without, you know, I only want publicly available information, I'm not sort of digging. How, how does your experience of Barry Diller as an entrepreneur and a businessman differ from that of Rupert Murdoch? You know, remember, I was 25 years old when I entered News Corp. Yeah. So, um, Barry Diller and Rupert Murdoch. And Barry Diller left probably three months after I joined and he, you know, he, he did something when he left that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to do. And it's a little bit about why I went to Bali, which is, you know, he, you know, I think he bought a Mustang convertible and drove across the country to clear his head. Right. Um, Sounds like and, John Malone and his, um, you know, well, he does it every summer. Buses. He does that every summer to go to Maine because I think his yeah. wife does fly something. Like and, this. and Sam Zell had this thing with bikes. I don't know how close you were to Sam Zell. Uh, he recently passed away, unfortunately, but not at all. Yeah. Uh, what did he do? He just bike, he would bike across the country. He was a, he was like a he 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 had a collection of Harleys. He'd like ride them and give gifts around them, and like he was just like he loved being a biker, you know. Uh, yeah, badass. Uh, look, I mean, both Barry and Rupert are uh, unsentimental, um, pretty hard nosed uh, business people. In my you know, just in the way I experienced them, which wasn't really directly. Um. And that's not who I am. I mean, I, you know, when you when you're early in your career, you think that that's the way you need to be uh, to be successful. Um, and I'm nowhere. In, you know, I've had a successful career, but I'm not Barry Dillard. I'm not Rupert Murdoch by any means. Um, but I've made um, you know, I've accepted that, and I've you know, I've, I've, I think of myself much more as living my life than driving my career. Um, but that's not always the way I live my life. Um, I was, I was. Uh, deeply, deeply focused on being successful and deeply focused on achievement in my own kind of way. And, you know, I did what, you know, I, I think I behaved then as I still do now, which is, you know, what can you learn from whomever is successful and, you know, what do you want to take and what can you throw away? Yeah. And you got to recognize you are who you are and you're not Barry Diller and you're not, you know, John Malone and you're, you know, right. I'm, I'm just comfortable, comfortable in my own shoes. But I think that the one thing that I would say, uh, you know, when I when I was in the entertainment business, it was standard, pretty standard culturally to do things like yell and scream and throw things at people. And, um, you know, I've learned that that's really terrible leadership. 
I think the world has learned that's pretty terrible leadership. I don't think you can get away with that. Man. But I remember um, there was a guy named Stephen Chow who really was the, one of the fathers of reality television. He was a fox. He developed a show called Cops, which is still on. And it's just like he was, he was the leader in reality television. And I walked into his office and he had this frame on a wall with nothing in it. I said, what is that? And he's like, well, if you look closely, there's a dent in the middle of that frame on the wall. There's a dent on the wall. And that's where Barry Diller threw a video cassette tape at my head. And I ducked and it hit the wall. And he threw it with such force that I made a dent in the wall. <laughs> so, I, you know, that, that's, I, that, that type of stuff, I, you know, you know, you kind of, you're 25 years old and you hear those stories like, you know, I don't know if I'd ever be like that. And now, now I think like, why would you ever want to be like that? Yeah. Yeah. There's so much that one can dive into around that, that probably we don't have time to do we, on an extended conversation would be able to do. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to, well, yes, I was going to throw a, a, a bone to my value investing audience. You know, I I didn't work. I came across Warren Buffett. Did you ever, in your time, uh, in early in your career, come across Warren Buffett? Did he ever sort of like? Did you ever kind of? Yeah, I'm just curious to well, know what you're. He spoke at at business school when I was there, um, and uh, you know, so I came to business school as I said from the World Bank. So I was like one of those. I felt like I was a diversity candidate. Everybody else comes from Goldman and McKinsey, right? Uh, you know, I was there kind of doing good in Africa. And I just like, you know, I had the most to learn. I had a really, really hard first year. So when Warren Buffett came and it's q and I, you know, I kind of, again, I kind of sat back and listened as opposed to really grill him. Um, but I remember one of the uh, guys who had come from KKR or wherever, one at LBO shop in my class. And he was asking Warren Buffett about, um, you know, what he, what he thinks about LBOs generally. And he had this great, this Warren Buffett way of answering the question, which was, well, I think about being in the car, driving at 180 miles an hour, and a knife taped to the steering wheel pointed at your heart. And, you know, you better not hit a bump on the road, or it's going to be. Yeah. He's got this amazing way of speaking about things. He's, he's an amazing analogy, you know? Well, I think it's, I mean, it's part of his public personas, it's all shucks kind of like you know simplicity of the of doing things yeah and, uh you know and you and i both know it's far more complex than that the, the truth of it is far more complex yeah. than that you know and it's kind of yeah and but in any case i funnily enough i it, i was he came at the during my i don't remember if it was first or second year it must have been first year and uh i was at the back of the room very upset with some girl who I'd felt had jilted me because I thought we were an item, but then I discovered the night before she was hanging out with some other guy and that's where I was and I wasn't paying too. She she actually said to me, she said, I, I you know, rather than yell at me, why, aren't you interested in hearing what this super investor has to say? And I was like, why, why, why would I listen to some guy claim that the market's not efficient when I can take you to task for having been out with somebody else the night before? <laughs> So it passed me by the first time around, but um, well, it co you know, I cost. As I recall from your book, it cost you six hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> well, you know, to get you to him to, the second you time, to get, yeah. you had to pay for lunch for it. With yeah, him. I could have. I could have asked him a question for free at the front of the room at the end of that. Sure. But um, and I, I don't think I'm engaging in much of a plot spoiler here. But um, your book opens with an incredible success, where you and a group of people were successful in taking over control of a company called take two interactive and so at that time you were working what sounds like sort of like an activist fund private equity i mean sounds really super exciting and um i i'm just curious to hear a little bit about the transition to that private equity activist I'm, type I'm, situation and and the book is tantalizing for me because it sort of talks about the successful takeover of take two because the point of the book is to talk about you know, stepping back from this high pressured, um, sort of ambitious career. But I found myself wanting to find, learn all the details. And I guess if I go into uh, filings, I could find them. But um, maybe just a little bit of, I mean, we'll leave people to read the book to under, to learn about the transition from take two to Bali. But it sounds amazing. Like, you know, corporate activism, people dream. Well, you know, the, the truth is that, um, 
uh, we did something that was done, that has never been done before or since, I'm told, in corporate American history, which is uh, we literally showed up at the annual shareholder meeting of a public company where nobody shows up um, with all the votes in the room. We brought all the votes with us. Yeah. And the general counsel of the company, who's the, who's the chair of the meeting, basically gets up pro forma. Here are the company's nominees for the board of directors. Are there any other nominees? And the lead shareholder gets up and says, yes, actually, I'd like to nominate Ben and Strauss and uh, a whole new slate of directors. We kept two on, but replaced everybody else. And at four o'clock in the afternoon, general counsel came over to us and said, well, congratulations. You got 70% of the vote. See you in the office tomorrow. We fired the CEO. We fired the CFO. I became the interim CEO. And, and as these things go, interim became permanent. Now, the reason we did it that way was because we didn't want any of the nastiness. You know, we weren't interested. You know, uh, my partners and I were kind of thought of ourselves more as managers of businesses and not as activist shareholders. Um, we had an ambition to have a platform to operate and build and create kind of a large enterprise out of. And, uh, you know, almost like a mini IAC and mini Barry Diller. And, but you need a starting point for that kind of thing. It's hard to do um, with small businesses. This is a fairly, you know, at the time for us, kind of fairly sizable businesses doing about a $700 million. This market cap was about $700 million. Um, but it was troubled in all sorts of ways. I mean, it, it was like in crazy, crazy kind of ways. It had, it had won the trifecta of SEC investigation, FTC investigation, and Manhattan District Attorney's Office um, criminal investigation. CEO was indicted. I mean, it was just, uh, and, you know, uh, it doesn't get much worse. For some reason, I remember going to my partnership and, and for some reason I thought this was a great opportunity. And they looked at me and like I was, I got three eyes. I was like, are you nuts? It was a, such a piece of garbage. I was like, no, you know what it is? It's like, to get, I'll try my hand at Warren Buffett. I was like, it's like an open festering wound with pus oozing all over the place. And he goes, but, but, but what you need to recognize is that pus is a sign of healing and all the news is out and this, it's all reflected in the stock price. And, you know, and we, we had done successful turnarounds in the past and we thought, you know, we recognized a lot of the patterns here and thought well, we could turn it around. Today, it's over $20 billion market cap yeah, and it's very, very successful. Success. It's a very, and very you you had capital on the line there as well, so it's not just that you'd no. won a proxy battle. No, no, no capital, just, just no money down. So just to take a step back. So again, the reason we did it because we didn't because we thought ourselves as management and never wanted to do anything hostile to management. Um, we figured out a way to do it without a fight. So the subtext and all of that is that um, because of all the trouble the company had been in, the auditors wouldn't sign off on the financials. And because the auditors wouldn't sign off, they wouldn't hold a share. They couldn't hold a share. Uh, they couldn't file their annual report. They couldn't file their annual report. They couldn't have a shareholder meeting. If they couldn't have a shareholder meeting, NASDAQ said, we're going to delist you. Yeah. So they're two minutes away from being delisted. And um, so, you know, I kind of, we sort of felt like, sh it's not like we went activist. It's the act, the shareholders themselves came to us and sort of said, help. Right. We need help. And, and the reason we did it with no money down is when you do activists uh, and activist um, things like this, if you want to coordinate among mutual funds and hedge funds and the other shareholders, um, you have to file as a group and, with the SEC. And for any number of reasons, yeah. uh, hedge funds and mutual funds don't want to do that. And it's a huge violation if you're communicating with other, if you're coordinating and you don't file as a group, you can get into right. huge trouble. Well, it turns out uh, we we found the lawyer who wrote some of that regulation um, and said and asked for his help. And it turns out that if you can organize the shareholder in such a way in a hub and spoke system where there is a non shareholder that's the hub and all the shareholders are the spokes, they can talk to the hub but not to each other, and the hub can coordinate. But specifically, the hub cannot be a shareholder. Right. So it works so, out well as 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 the um, candidate management, basically. Right. We sort of said, we're not interested in this. We're interested in the management contract. Right. You guys can, by, by the way, there's a huge short position on it. And a lot of the hedge funds were just interested in the squeeze, which right. happened. Right. And th there was a long negotiation about how long they needed to be locked up for because they just wanted to be out the next day. And, um, but I would say that, uh, 
you know, that is an alignment of stars that rarely happens. And I haven't seen it happen since. Where you had well. part of the regulation, by the way, is that you can't solicit more than 10 shareholders. So right. you need to have 10 shareholders that constitute a majority of the shareholdings in order right. to see so a fairly concentrated shareholder base. And you need a company that's deeply in trouble, a fairly concentrated shareholder base that's motivated to change out management. Now, for what it's worth, my experience of the kinds of very smart, brilliant lawyers who are around this kind of corporate control type regulation is that they don't come cheap. So either you had money down there, you know, you would have been on the hook as a partnership for the lawyer's fees, or perhaps, I don't know, maybe the, the, these, your advisors were on contingency fees. I'm curious if you're allowed to share. Oh, no, no, we, uh, we had, no, we were paying lawyers and we've had, you know, there were a number of kind of scary moments of like, Guys, were you know we got in at some point we were in deep, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and it was you know it was bad, but we were well, we were in. Yeah, I should not dive too deep down the rabbit hole of mechanics of it. I, I what from my experience once around a bank the bankruptcy courts in Delaware is that you know if you if you play your card cards right as the vulture group, you can kind of like um, put many of your legal fees. In, into the corporation once you yeah. get in there with yeah. the court. Yeah. Uh, so so I'm going to move on because you know time is 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 limited, but there's so many rabbit holes to go down. Um, and Ben's already told me so so he you know the excuse is up front that he's 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 active in gaming, metaverse, um, artificial intelligence. We're going to get into that, but I am very curious because Ben thinks he's got no specific knowledge, but I have these debates with friends about who's going to win in uh, the battle, say, between the streamers and the owners of content, say, in music. Uh, and uh, there are people that I respect very highly who have significant stock positions in companies like Universal Music that own content. And I also have enormous respect for some people who believe that that will eventually get chipped away by the streamers. And I'm just would love to draw you on that debate and see what kind of insights you might be able to share. I mean, there's a third element to that debate right now is like, will, will AI create music? And, you know, and that, I mean, that's kind of the big one that we'll think people think will tip the scales towards the, the distributors and the streamers, because if, you know, you can get a machine to create the music, then, you know, you're not reliant on the copyright holders at places like universal music. Right. Um, and, uh, I'm pretty sure that's wrong. I'm like, you know, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll stake my claim that yeah. uh, a computer will not create a hit. Maybe it'll create one hit, but it's not going to create a library of hits. Um, it could create elevator music, perhaps. I mean, it could create great music. I mean, it could create pop music that really appeals to a young audience. Um, I have a whole riff on AI and art, and uh, we can go down the ra that yes, rabbit hole. Yes, yes, we will go down that rabbit hole for a while. Um, and and um, so I, just to give you an advertisement, um, uh, it's uh, the the title of Ben's article that he wrote is uh, "Creativity's Big Bang Moment," which I, I it's it's obvious once you've read it, and we'll certainly have a link to it if Ben allows. But um, but so so no. before we get there, do do stay on uh, the stream. Oh, so the stream. Well, first of all, one way to play it is to play both. And and when I was in the when I was at Fox, I mean, there was this constant interplay between distribution and production and who's got the real leverage. Um, I do, so I, you know, and I think that both of them are powerful businesses in their own right. And I know when, we're, when we were at, when I was at Tencent, I mean, we had positions in both Universal Music and Spotify. Right. Um, and so it's not, that's not a terrible way to play it. I tend to um, believe in the power of copyright as, um, as a scare as a scarce resource and uh and i you know especially if you have high quality content and franchises it's very very difficult to compete with that on the one hand on the other hand you know access to audience and act is is critical and i do think that if you think about access to audience i think it's easier to create competition on the streaming side than it is to create it on the uh on Kind of the library of music, the vast libraries of music. Yeah. I mean, just for your interest, Ben, um, 
I I had, you know, in my anti-library and I have many more books, I own many more books than I've actually read and I love buying them and it's a less expensive hobby than all sorts of other expensive hobbies. But I finally yeah. read Ovitz on Ovitz and it kind of opened my mind to, and, and many of my friends have heard me say this, I was blown away after I started focusing on it, how much of the world of talent is agented. So just to give uh, one example, I have a friend, I'm going to name him because he's been on this podcast, uh, Francisco Negrin. He's a opera director and he has an agent. He's yep. agented. And um, so, and, you know, uh, casting agents have, for movies, have agents. And so uh, the, the question I have for you as an author and, you know, reading the acknowledgements in your book, you you acknowledged I believe your agent and a number of other people who collaborated with you, uh, many people self-publish today. And yep. uh, I'm just curious if you can maybe just briefly, and and I talk to many people who, who are in the midst of writing books, want to write books. Uh, when you get asked that question, do you advise people to go the self-publishing route or the agent route? Uh, first of all, I'm going to correct you something. I tell people all the time, I wrote a book. I'm not an author. I just wrote a book. Uh, uh, just, I hate to tell you I'm you are an author. That's just modesty. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you. I'll say you something to tell you something, Ben, that you'll appreciate once you get over the sting. Is don't be so modest. You're not that great. Is what <laughs> Golda Meir told her ministers. You're an author. <laughs> um, anyway, I would anyway. say. Uh, I would say it. De- well, first of all, first of all, it depends what kind of author, right? There's kind of. Oh, just, you, just like, sorry, in, just like I, in Hollywood, there's the, there's the A list and there's the B list and there's everybody else. And I would say, are you a first time author? Are you a third time author? Do you have a franchise? These are all very different scenarios. Yeah. I would, and then for a first time author that has resources, I would self publish. You know, there is a there is a patina around having a big publishing house and an agent, uh, and all of that that belies you know what they actually do for you as an author i think that you know as a first-time author maybe you'll get a publishing deal um and maybe they'll uh you know put some money against it and like and, and fiction and non-fiction they're all different categories so it all depends um and i spent a bunch of time thinking about this but if you're in a situation where you your choices are getting a publisher that's going to give you a small marketing budget and see how it goes versus uh, having resources, self-publishing, uh, and being able to put the resources against it that to give the book the chance that it deserves. Uh, I would do that, even though there's a little bit of a sting around, oh, you self-published? You know, that's a vanity book. So and maybe it is, maybe it isn't. There are literally a million books put out every year. It is yeah. so hard to break through. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know a little thing, and I know a thing or two about uh, you know, marketing to consumers. And the deal that I struck with my publisher was some hybrid of that, which was like, I'll put up the marketing budget. Right. And, uh, and you know, I'll recoup that. And then for, as far as I'm concerned, you can have everything else. And um, it's not quite the deal we ended up striking, but that's what I cared about. I cared about, I don't know why I cared about this, but, you know, having written the book, you might as well give it, you might as well let it be out there in the wild and you might as well give it the chance it deserves to find an audience. And I didn't think any of the publishers as a first time author as a person that didn't have, you know, a giant Instagram following, which is what they look for. Um, I thought that was the sensible thing to do. You know, um, for your interest, I, um, so I, I was published by Palgrave Macmillan but I also put money into the book. I, I gave, and I mentioned his name because he's the best in the business, I believe, a guy called Mark Fortier, uh, a pile of money. to. And I understood that you you need to break through and that the publisher isn't going to help you. And over and above that, Ben, uh, because I just wanted my book to appear in the pages of The New Yorker, and I know there was no chance that they were going to review my book. The New York Times hadn't reviewed it. The New, New Yorker wasn't going to review it. So I bought an ad in The New Yorker just that I could... Mm-hmm. So that the 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 title of my book and my name could appear in front of the New Yorker readers, and I could claim to have been in there. So my experience of sort of understanding what agents do is that, 
you know, it was a it was an eye opening moment for me to go onto a website that gave you gave a location, uh, op potential live acts for that location, and literally, if you're some um, music hall, there are thousands of acts. There are probably twenty people who will give you a Michael Jackson act or variations on a Michael Jackson act. And what I realized was that if you don't have an agent then you're not going to get that very, very slight, subtle edge at some key moment. And I um, have actually, I've told even first-time authors, if you can get that edge through an agent, do it. But I'm not a guy who has the experience that you have, and we shouldn't take too long on it. So I'll give you the last word on that little debate and um, see how you come back to me. Right. After the podcast, I'll tell you a joke about agents. <laughs> okay, not to not to insult any agents, I, I'm going to move on. And um, and I this is like what I just love being able to do on these podcasts is and so I literally yesterday, I, 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 I buy one or two shares of a whole bunch of companies that pop up and are interesting to me. And then I get their annual reports once a year, because I do not allow Charles Schwab to send them to me physically to, to, to send me electronically. So I got a pile of annual reports here. And I went through the IMAX annual report yesterday. Um, their their revenues. I'm not expecting you to have read it, but their revenues dipped heavily during COVID, and um, I'm just curious. You know, it's a it's a special way of showing movies. Uh, it's a special platform. I think we've all watched them, and when we get the movies that are done right, that it's quite an incredible experience. And I'm just curious. You know, that's the kind of business that maybe a a, a Rupert Murdoch, Fox, uh, Barry Diller could have invested into. Might have thrown at you to look at. Yeah, I did look at it. I looked at it probably, you know, maybe uh, 10, probably longer, 15 years ago. It went, when it was in trouble, um, we did look at it. I don't. I mean, it's, I think it's done very well. It's done much better than anybody expected for, you know, a, you know, a closed platform yeah. that uh, very capital intensive. Um, and I think when we looked at it, it was probably before the age of streaming and before uh, film theater theaters generally um, were really struggling as a result of people just watching at home. And, um, and I think IMAX today gives people a reason to go out and especially in COVID, especially after COVID and especially because of all the in-home uh, you know, options that consumers have the ability to go out and be with people is powerful. And, you know, even the non IMAX theaters, the more open platform theaters are struggling to find ways of bringing the audience, you know, putting butts in seats. And so they're selling sushi as opposed to popcorn and they're, you know, having, have, you know, table side service as opposed to, you know, just buying a ticket and going to see the movie. So that model has changed, but, you know, in that world, I guess IMAX is probably the, the granddaddy and probably the best that there is, right? There's a reason to go. There's a reason yeah. to go see an IMAX film. I mean, it, for me, it's in the too hard pile. It, it's it's not a home run, and uh, you know, capital intensity. And um, no. in any case, I, I'm now going to move on to an area where. So Ben was a, uh, you know, I, I hope I don't sound flattering. I don't intend to sound flattering. He was a rock star at our Value X event because you brought. First of all, I, I mean, he Ben brought an amazing presentation. Felt like a McKinsey style presentation. Deep knowledge of. What I would say, you know, metaverse, AI, and gaming questions. But before we get into uh, the a AI and creativity's big bag moment, I need you to know, Ben, that I hate video games. I would destroy every single video game in my home if I could. It bothers me that uh, one of my children pays, spends an awful lot of time on them. I've heard all the arguments how they're supposed to be great. And I'm sure you hear it all the time because you'll meet people in a social setting and they'll be they'll say the same thing. So I'm sure you have a very well practiced response that I'd like to hear. Um, I don't really. I just like I, I I'm a parent also, right? And for a long time, even when I was an executive at Take Two, I restricted the the access that my kids had to all sorts of screens. Um, and I'm you know I'm guilty of what people describe Silicon Valley parents as being like, you know, they sell, you know, they, they won't give to their kids what they sell to everybody else. But, um, and especially when my kids were, we were putting out Grand Theft Auto when I was there and my kids were young and 
you know, people would ask me about it. Would you let your kids play the game? I was like, it's, you know, it's not for kids. It says it on the box, 17 or over. It's not meant for children. The average, when I was there, the average Grand Theft Auto player was a male in his late 30s. Um, and so, you know, do I believe that it is, I think it's an extraordinary art form. I think it's an extraordinary entertainment uh, genre. It's, it's, it's gone beyond entertainment at this point. We can get into it about my theories yeah. about what's happening in the video game sector. But, it, you know, you you can fight it at your peril, not your peril, but I mean, it's going to happen whether you like it or not. And, um, and for whatever reason, it's getting more and more engaging and it's becoming a bigger and bigger business. Um, and I think parents should always, uh, you know, guide their children and protect their children. And I would say the same thing about social media and texting and all, all the rest of it. Right. I kind of, as a parent, I, I'm very, you know, my, my kids are grown now, but I was very yeah. careful about making sure that this was contained in the right way. And so that's my view. So I've, I've played once or twice Grand Theft Auto with my son, who was, I think, 14 at the time. He didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't, I, I didn't even see the box. I didn't know that it was 17 and older. I wish I'd known that at the time. I would tell everyone that one of the, uh, really beautiful things in Ben's book is that he talks about his relationship with and the different personalities of each of your four children, Ben. And it's kind of really lovely. And uh, it's it's kind of a shows a courage and a vulnerability to be to be willing to talk about one's family. And and it shows uh, something about them that they're willing to appear in the book in that way. I'm sure you would have consulted with them and asked them. But I, I guess. Um, uh, so you know we're we're already um, a bit of time into this, and I, I want to give you the chance to kind of communicate the key ideas, which were mind blowing for us that you communicated at Value X, that were new for me around what the metaverse means, what's happening to gaming, um, and I, I, is that enough of a prompt for you, Ben? Um, it is, uh, I suppose. I don't know where I want to go with it, but I. Um... Well, first of all, I would say that the metaverse doesn't require goggles, in my opinion. So, you know, that whole thing, I think, you know, may or may not come. And I think Apple's recent entry into that area, I think is super interesting. Uh, I think it's a long way away from getting massively adopted. Um, but if you think of the metaverse as uh, this alternative world where you can adopt a different persona and live uh, some other life that, is different than the life you have in the real world, then that already exists and it's in video games. Um, I've had people tell me that, you know, you can you can shake your head and say this is pathetic, but I've had, literally had people say that the most impactful emotional experience they've had in their lives was in a video game. And this is from somebody who's old enough and has been in the business long enough when the key question was, well, if the video game is like a movie, can a video game actually make you cry? And um, I think the answer for sure is yes now. And I think wow. with that particular event, what he meant was, uh, I know the game he was playing, and this is a game that requires a lot of strategy and a lot of coordination among different people, all in spaceships, and uh, and launching a coordinated attack on you know a different civilization um, or defending against attack by another civilization. But the but the camaraderie that he would describe is the camaraderie that you hear about about soldiers in battle, and um, even though it's played from some rig in his basement, so those those world those those worlds exist, and the emotional connection among people exists. And what I've discovered in so two things I'll say about video games in the metaverse: people still, when I hear reports, business reports about the video game industry. Um, it used to be, oh, it's bigger than box office. Oh, it's bigger than worldwide film. Oh, it's bigger than film and something else. And the reason it just, it gets, keeps getting bigger is because I think the framing is wrong. I think it's no longer a section or a sector of the media business. I think what we're discovering within video games and these persistent worlds online is that more and more of what has been traditional media is taking place within video games. music and music discoveries happening within video games, uh, film, fashion, sports, 
consumer brands all having presence online in these video games. And, um, and so I think all of that just makes it bigger and bigger. And then the other thing is that, uh, you know, if you talk to kids today about what they do when they come home from school, when you and I were growing up, maybe you'd call your friend. And, um, when my kids are growing up, maybe they text their friends. Today, you don't, you do all of that within a video game. You come home, you get online, you're in a video game and you talk to friends, you get on a discord channel, you get on the, you know, you get on the chat channel and it's all. And so communication is taking place within video games. So it's not just media formats, it's different types of activities and e-commerce is not very far behind. And so it's not a terrible leap to sort of say what you're used to doing in a browser as, an, as a consumer, you will do within a video game. And by extension, video games are becoming the three-dimensional internet. And, um, and I think that's a really powerful concept to think about, okay, what does that mean exactly? What does that mean from a business perspective? What does that mean from a cultural perspective? Um, but I, you know, one way or another, it's happening. These games are getting larger and the introduction of AI is going to accelerate that in a way that, um, and, uh, you know, at a speed that I think we have never witnessed before. Yeah. So, so many things. I, I'll just give three um, sort of like things that arise for me. One is that I hope that the emotional connection that you were describing in the spaceship thing was with real people. I would tell you that yeah. my son playing Call of Duty, I believe, is the game. There's a character that is not, is a game-generated character. And he would tell us over the dinner table that it's so weird because he knows that this is uh, not a real person, but he develops real feelings for this sort of like brotherhood of battle type of deal, which is utterly yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Um, a second point, just a takeaway for me, is this awareness or the realization I got from your presentation that these worlds have become persistent. So, and I know there's probably uh, some really profound implications for the economics of video game development, but. Um, uh, you you go the, the the video games are going to continual release where you continue to come back into that world and something that you left in that world and you yep. did, you exit it for a while yep. is there when you come back to it and yep. i.e. the metaverse right <laughs> and you know somewhere the word Roblox comes up and you know some of us don't inhabit the metaverse but then uh, you know I think that just to go to AI for a second. I know that I'm certain that every single person listening to this has had conversations with ChatGPT, and I'm certainly going up a learning curve on how to use ChatGPT. But um, it's a whole different level of using artificial intelligence when actually you're pressing a button on and saying, telling the AI, create this world or create this character, or which which kind of like basically it gives a whole new meaning to no code. And I, I know I'm talking a language that I don't really understand. So maybe you can elaborate what I, the point I'm trying to get to properly. I mean, as if, as an, as if I were an AI and can read your mind. <laughs> well, I think that these, that I'm just telling the audience that this is, these are ideas that I literally read in an email that um, Ben shared with me. So, you know, just to bring you up to date on Ben's life, he came back from Bali and now runs a, a venture capital fund. He invests in startups, and he'll we, he'll talk a little bit more about Tirta later. But uh, you know, the 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 public piece or the piece that I was allowed to share with a few friends was way less interesting than the narrative which he shared with me privately. But I was, I mean, I was just reading it before coming onto this conversation, Ben, and. Um, I was blown away just by this idea and the insight that, and maybe this is obvious to you, but it's not obvious to me. You know, having AI help me write a letter by asking a few questions is one thing. Having AI write a whole suite of software is just a whole different level of productivity. It's kind of like, yeah, it's it's an exponential level of productivity. And and I'm still thinking in an unbelievably linear fashion about these things. And you know, you're not thinking about how do you help Guy Spear or other people like Guy Spear write a letter. You're thinking about how does AI help a company write all its software with one person in the in the IT department type of deal. And I'm just, you know, if you, if you're able to elaborate on that in a way that you're allowed to and able to, and maybe try and educate people of my ilk a little bit more about that kind of exponential thinking. 
Uh, it's so vast, I don't know where to begin. Um, well, why don't we start with video games and AI? I think the article that you referenced earlier um, about uh, creativity. So the analogy that I have, I mean, this is, it is a huge productivity tool on the one hand. On the other hand, it's it's uh, a little bit of a paradigm shift, right? When I think of a productivity tool, I think, you know, doing the same job in a much more efficient way. But I think the job itself will change. And, uh, you know, what I, the analogy that I have when it comes to AI and everybody's concerned, everybody's going to lose their jobs, which I don't believe for a moment, um, is that is the, uh, the introduction of the photographic process at the end of the 19th century in Paris. And there were two fundamental things that came out of that that are hugely impactful. First and foremost, if you asked an art historian, what was the single thing that uh, was the genesis of modern art, it was the camera. Because, you know, before that, you'd, you'd pay an artist to take a portrait, draw a landscape, do some sort of narrative drawing. <clears throat> and, you know, if you can just do it with a snap of a button, huge increase in productivity. Well, what do all the artists do? And what the artists did was two things. One is like they asked themselves the existential question, like, well, what do we paint now? Um, and that led to modern art writ large, in my opinion. And the other important aspect is that the photographic process in photography became an art form in and of itself. And I could see a very similar thing happening with AI and video games where um, using chat GPT or, I mean, just as, as a proxy, but for AI generally, that it becomes its own art form, certainly within video games um, and elsewhere in illustration and drawing. And, um, and we're, already, we're, we're already seeing some of that. We're already seeing AI artists emerge. <clears throat> and then in terms of um, creativity, I don't know where it's going to lead. I mean, the thing about the Big Bang is, you know, at that brief moment, you know, who know who, you know, that's that, that microsecond, it was all it was, was energy. Who knew where it was going to go to lead to you and me having this podcast right now. Yeah. And um, you couldn't predict it at the time. So, uh, so I think a similar thing with AI, I think you're right to focus not just on chat GPT, but also on the ability to create programming languages, uh, sorry, program uh, software. Um, that's uh, probably, you know, many, many orders of magnitude more efficient than you can do today. Yeah. I think it's a mistake to think this is all new. This, I mean, this has been, AI has been thought about and developed for decades and decades. And it's all, we're all just, we're, we're just now reaping the benefit of many, many decades of research and thought. Um, and so we, uh, we think that in the video game sector, there are a number of implications for that. We think that the marginal cost of creating the assets that are within video games are going to zero or approach zero, you know, in some sort of um, asymptotic kind of approach to a limit. Uh, if the costs go to zero, we think the size of these worlds go to infinity. We think the speed of iteration goes to instantaneous. We think the quality of the game goes to AAA. Um, and that's kind of first order implications. Second order implications is just like the camera, all of a sudden everybody becomes a developer in the way that a camera allowed anybody to become an artist and snap a photograph. And, um, and we can imagine a world where it's as simple to create a video game as it is to create a TikTok video today. And, um, and what does that mean? And so, you know, thinking back to music, and all the rest of it, you know, most art forms like this follow a power law distribution, not a regular, not a normal distribution like the 80-20 rule, but more the power law distribution like the 98% two rule, right? 2% of what's created will be hugely successful and 98% will be pedestrian, not in its, not in its creative output, but in its just commercial viability. Um, you know, think about the million books that we were just talking about that produce yeah. a year. How do you break through, right? So it wouldn't surprise me if if you ran the numbers, and I haven't, where the that power law distribution played out in new releases of books, and you'd have, call it 2 to 5% that are real commercial successes and everything else struggles. So, um, and, but the, but if you can get into the 2%, 
the numbers are just, you know, astronomical. Yeah. So uh, we think all of this is really, really interesting. And as an adventure capital investor, you're always focused on how do I make every one of my investments need to have a path to anywhere from 10 to hundred times your money or more. Yeah. You're always looking for things that could pop and can be ginormous. And this has the, those characteristics. And so that's a great segue to talk about your return f- from Bali and um, the transition to Terata. Uh, you know, there's there's one key moment when you realize you weren't going to go and get into some kind of attempt to take over an existing company. And yeah. I and you know you're you're certainly aware of the extraordinarily high failure rates and risks around VC. And I'm certain you're also aware of. And this is just to set it up for you the um, extraordinary concentration of um, successful investments in a very small number of firms. So in a certain way, by setting up Terta, you're competing, no doubt, with Sequoia, A16Z, um, some extremely successful venture capital firms that have got a kind of a lock hold on an enormous amount of talent. And so yeah. curious to hear your thought processes. Well, we've set it up in such a way. So I know all those guys and that invest in video games and in the venture capital world, as opposed to say mid-market private equity, where, you know, if you're putting a deal together, you want to invite somebody in mid-market private equity. If you bring somebody in, you're probably going to promote their capital. In the venture capital world, it's not really that way. They kind of, if you have something to add as a board director, as an observer, as a shareholder, right, you're invited to deal without anybody promoting your capital. And we've set up Tirta to really be, you know, a sector specialist that can invest alongside um, some of the best investors in the world. And we think that we have um, uniquely a lot to add when it comes to video game investments. And we happen to have gotten lucky, or I haven't happened to have gotten lucky that, you know, at this stage in my career, there seems to be an enormous amount of investor appetite in this particular sector. And the traditional way of an uh, operator uh, getting involved in those type of worlds is to, you know, just, uh, be an operating partner or a venture partner and, you know, tag along for the deals that you wanted to do and either go operate them or go on the board of them. Um, and I just took it one step further and I just um, sort of said, well, why don't we, in addition to that, write a check on behalf right. of our office. Unlike and, what you did at Take Two. Which is not write a check, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so that's kind of the way we've set it up. And, you know, we've done a few investments to date. It's a fairly young firm. And, um, but we've led none of them. We've just sort of said, you know, we want to contribute. Most venture capitalists will sort of will say their pitch is we're not just capital value add. And we say, we're not just, we're not just value add. We also have a little check to write. Right. And, and so, so and, and out of curiosity, um, so because I, I'm sure there is at least some people listening to this who'll go, my God, I'd like to invest. A, I'd like to put my some of my money where his is. Um, what it, you know, what? So, uh, I I can only imagine that you can pick and choose who you want to have join you in Terata. And what do your ideal uh, partners, limited partners, look like? What who who gets to audition with you? You're talking about limited partners, not not people in the firm. Yeah, yeah. There are probably a whole bunch of people who'd like to work for you. I, if I was 20 years younger, I would have liked to work for you. No, I'm talking about um, people who might be at my stage in life who kind of say, "Oh, I would really love to have some money running with." Uh, well, I have to, I have to be careful there, guy, because I'm not allowed to solicit. Um, oh, that's right. You are not allowed to solicit for all sorts of reasons. Mainly no. because Ben's in the United States and in other developed countries, you're not allowed to. Um, uh, ben, you you got me in an area where I under, I know really really well. So, yep. so, okay. Go. so uh, Go. You, okay, you're man. not allowed to solicit a bit, but I, I I want to reassure you that if you're I'm asking you that question, I think it's a legitimate question, and it 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 well anyway, I shouldn't push you too hard, but I guess um, you know. Yeah, I guess I just have to leave it alone because you don't want to get into trouble with your very conservative lawyers. So maybe if uh, you are interested and you want to get in touch with Ben offline, we can find a way to connect you up. So I'm going to just leave that question alone. Yeah, let's leave that one alone. Let's leave that (laughs) uh, one alone. I I would just tell you, everyone, that that is an example. It's really fascinating to me 
uh, that is an example of Ben, and I haven't had a conversation with you on this, playing center court. So this is from a, a, a statement, I think, by Don Keogh, who was a, um, a director of Coca-Cola and of Berkshire Hathaway. And, you know, don't play around the edges. Don't kind of go into the gray area. Play right in the center. There's enough money and relationships and good things to happen in center court. And so uh, I really appreciate you doing that, actually, Ben. And I'm going to take it to, um, and I think that it's, so, uh, um, you know, I, well, I, yeah, there's so many places I could, another rabbit hole, not a rabbit hole, fascinating to look at some of the investments that you've made. And I really appreciate the opportunity to have looked at that. But uh, in your book, and what's great about talking to somebody who's written a book is that's already in the public domain. You tell the reader that your mother is a psychotherapist or practiced as a psychotherapist. And as a huge consumer of psychotherapy myself, and uh, you know, I haven't asked Ben this question, but if you live in New York, you know, most people in New York have at least psychother three psychotherapists per family member. I'm just curious what it's like growing up with a mother who's a psychotherapist. And oh my God. It's totally, it's totally true that the children of shrinks are the most crazy. So, <laughs> that's, I mean, that is, that is the su subject of my psychotherapy. So I don't know how far down you want to go into this. Well, well I'm curious what, you know, cause I, I've done all sorts of different kinds of therapy. I love all of them. I think that um, it's, you know, when we, when humanity reaches a, a, a truly evolved state, we'll all have multiple therapists. We won't, they won't be called therapists anymore, but maybe no, they'll, they'll be AI they'll generated. Be AIs. <laughs> Yeah, I'd st I'd still want a real person, but um, I'm curious what kind of therapy she practiced, and if in any way uh, you either learned from it or were screwed up by it. You know. Wow, uh, that's a very personal question, and I and, I, and I'm I'll, I'll try to answer it honestly as I can um, because it's, it's not that there's a dishonest a dishonest part of it. It's just it's just complex and complicated. Um. First of all, she was a she was and is uh, kind of deeply into Freudian psychology. Um, so, whatever a Freudianist, whatever the right word is, uh, she was a Freudian. Um, and I've learned since that you know psychotherapy has really moved beyond some some basic concepts of Freud, even as brown, groundbreaking as it was. Uh, that there is there is more to it, um, and so. Uh, but I grew up with that kind of thing um, where, you know, nothing is taken really at face value. And, you know, there's always some hidden motivation to something or other. Um, and I honestly believed growing up as a kid that my mother could read my thoughts. And, uh, and I think that probably led to me being a little protective of my thoughts. So, right. you know, um, and I've said, you know, and she was sort of, she would always tell me, like, I can't read your thoughts. You need to talk to me. I was like, well, I, I, but I didn't really believe it. I thought she could read my thoughts. So, um, so that's my own little craziness. My mom's still alive. I love her dearly. I, I call her, she lives in Israel, as, as you mentioned. And, right. you know, I call her multiple times a week. Um, and so we'll leave it there because we're getting close to the time when we, we have a hard stop in about 13 minutes. So we don't have... Um, much more time. I'll just tell you about a friend who also lives in New York, who's both his parents were psychotherapists, and they were the ones who would experiment with drugs. And he he told me that there was a moment when he as a teenager went into the living room, and he really kind of like berated his parents. And so you know, you've really got to stop with these drugs. I'm sick of it. You know, I think it was a time when um, people were experimenting with psychedelics, which seems to be coming back a little bit. And yeah. you provide a great segue for me to kind of like, round this off. And for any listener who uh, is um, finds this less interesting. I apologize. It is interesting to me. Um, I think that I admire the uh, what you've clearly done with your in your family is to create. You you clearly live a Jewish life. Uh, you've clearly brought up Jewish children. Uh, extremely well rooted in that identity, but at the same time, very universal and outward looking. And um, I don't think that's an easy thing to do. And I'm just curious, and, and it, for those of you who are not close to Israel, Israel is having a kind of a, a kind of a crisis moment where there's a real struggle between what is very particular about being a Jewish state 
and values that I know that Ben and I deeply hold, which is uh, liberal, um, egalitarian values where every ethnic minority has its place. And I, I, you know, I'm sure you've had discussions. I mean, uh, you know, any family that wants to have a Jewish identity in New York can, can take a path of extreme integration into the universal side of life and can go very deep into a modern or even ultra-Orthodox version of the world, which is very particularist. And I guess I hope that I've asked an open enough question for you to kind of share how you've navigated that as an individual and as your family. Uh, I'm still navigating it, honestly, because um, what I've discovered is having children that are growing up is that, you know, I've passed on that complexity to them, right? Because it's for everybody to, you know, for any Jew that wants to be thoughtful about it, um, you have to answer those questions for yourself. And um, I think one of the issues that Israel is facing and among the ultra Orthodox is this concept of there being one way, their the one way, i.e., their way to be Jewish. And I think there are many, many ways to be Jewish. Um, and uh, I think you're right. And I spoke about this a little bit in my book about, you know, wanting to teach my children to be both uh, rooted in their identity and be global citizens. And um, uh, and I think we gave them a lot of that. And, you know, as they navigate their way in the world and, you know, choose partners for themselves uh, for life, I think they're going to confront this. And my hope is that I've given them enough background, enough information to be able to make those choices for themselves. The last thing I want for them is to make a choice to make me happy. I want a yeah. choice that's make them happy. Um, and I think that you know, what comes up for me, and it's just a piece of wisdom that I've come across recently. And I feel like our job is not, my job is not to answer those questions for my children. My job is to reveal to them all the struggles of I've had and all the complexities that I've tried to deal with and, and to be as honest as I can with them so that they can, they, they don't fight shadow boxing. They're seeing the real thing. And yeah. I think that's probably true of many different kinds of struggles. In addition to being Jewish, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, cl I'm a closet Buddhist. And um, there's this concept in Buddhism of interconnectedness that I think has a particular, that is a universal concept, but I think it has application in the Jewish world also. And that there is a sense of interconnectedness. You know, the, there's a there's a part that uh, in my career that you missed, you kind of jumped over where I spent a bunch of years working for Tencent in China, running, you know, U.S. game, the U.S. operations for games for them. And I remember having this conversation in China with somebody who's like, you know, I sort of find so many similarities between Jews and Chinese. Um, but the one that we do not share is the sense of peoplehood and the sense of interconnectedness. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I don't think, you know, I know you understand what I'm saying. Maybe your audience doesn't, but, you know, if you I, are. Maybe the audience understands and I don't, Jen, just in case, you know. Oh, yeah. I just sort of, well, look, I just sort of think there is a sense that, you know, some Jews have, and I certainly have, of peoplehood, of uh, feeling like you're part of something much larger. Yeah. Which is which is the Jewish people. Um. And I would sort of, I was just commenting on the side that when you talk, when I would talk to friends in China, um, you know, they would, they would have a loyalty to their fan, their friends, their family, their clan, whatever, but it doesn't extend to the people of the, yep. the Chinese, one and a half billion Chinese people. Um, and as, and I do feel, and I thought it was interesting in the debate in Israel today, where it's getting, it's getting really nasty um, among uh, you know, the people on the right and the people on the left, we'll just call it, we'll just, I mean, there are many, many more sides to this polygon, but we'll just call it two-sided. Um, and you see these debates and at the end of the debate, somebody would sort of say, you know, uh, but you're still my brother. You know, I still, you know, I still love you kind of thing. Yeah. And that is the sort of sense that I want to impart to my children. I think it just happens kind of naturally. Something that fascinates me is how you know, my experience and attitude towards somebody changes between being in the diaspora, the Galut, and being in Israel from polar opposites. So people that, you know, I've, you know, to take one case in point, uh, I feel far more comfortable with the um, ultra-Orthodox community outside of Israel than in Israel for all sorts of reasons. I want to ask you a very specific question that Ben is completely unprepared for, but um, I, I'm well. It's two parts. So, do you spend any time studying any Jewish text, Talmuds, or anything else on a serious or non-serious basis? 
And um, if you had to kind of bring up the personalities, either from the Talmud, the great rabbis, or the prophets, or Abraham, Moses, you know, the, the forefathers, that you feel particularly close to in one way or another, or that is in your thoughts, I'm curious if there are any. No. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, well, there we have it. <laughs> I was like, I thought, you know, there's somebody that I need to introduce you to that, you know, um, Shimon Bar Yochai, he would have brought up this uh, Kabbalistic teacher who disappeared into a cave for two years. And there's stories about him. And there's a celebration in Israel every year in the city of Sfat. All sorts of things I could ask Ben about. And there's so many questions, more questions here. But I need to close this down because I need to respect Ben's time. He's got a busy day ahead of him, I'm sure. So uh, my last question to you, Ben, is thank you so much for joining and answering these questions. Um, you know, if people want to engage with you, uh, they, you know, what, how's the best way to get in touch with you? Is it LinkedIn, Twitter, nothing, something, uh, LinkedIn, your last link opportunity to sort of like engage with no, the audience, I guess. Link, link, LinkedIn is, uh, probably is great. I mean, I'm easy to find. Yeah. And, and they can reach out to you if they want to. Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. I love, I love, I love to meet people, especially. Yeah thoughtful and whatever it's been, this has been a great guy i've really enjoyed the yeah conversation. I, I, I just frustrated it last time i hang out with ben we had a wonderful session cross-country skiing and he got to meet my wife and as you can see i'm uh you know life is too short and too many things to explore ben yeah. it's been a real pleasure to have you join thank you so much no, it's been great thank you guy